have reached week five of our journey through church history, uh, beginning with the Crusades and culminating in the Reformation era. This is week five, Reformation part one. If you were hoping that today we would finally get to talk about Martin Luther deciding to take a stroll one morning and, and, and defacing church property, um, you have to wait this week. <laughs> uh, there's a whole lot of information, a whole lot of things that happen that lead up to our information. We'll talk a little bit about that today. Um, the disclaimers, standard disclaimers. Um, disclaimer number one I attempt to present a balanced viewpoint. Balanced in the sense that the information presented here is the latest, to the best of my knowledge, and most accurate according to current scholarship. Disclaimer number two, it is almost impossible to remain unbiased. Occasionally, whether it's by tone of voice, or in fact things I actually say, my opinion will creep through. Please be advised that the distinct possibility my opinion on certain issues may be different from yours. Um, it's also possible that my theological take may be different than yours. I welcome your pushback if it is, one, not entirely a knee-jerk reaction, and two, presented in a way that doesn't totally take us off course. Um, uh, that being said, uh, disclaimer number three. Even though we've become somewhat more granular in this class, and it seems like everything is highly detailed, it is in fact still an overview. And any overview at all, by its very nature, means that we'll be leaving out certain details. Um, if I've left out your favorite part of history that you want to know more about, please feel free to ask. If I know something about it, I'll be happy to share it. If I don't know something about it, and you want to know more, I'll be happy to research for you, especially if you remind me, preferably in the form of an email. If I don't see it in print, it's not that I'm being intentionally rude, it's just that it's going to go like this, and it's going to come out the other side. Um, uh, the gentleman here just asked me for uh, notes for the last uh, a couple of weeks, and I told him, sitting after class, I'll print it for you. Fortunately, it was, it was still in the journey from here to here, so I saw a couple of those things sitting on a shelf, and I said, I don't know whose those are, but they're mine now, and now they're yours. Um, okay, with that, let's begin with a word of prayer, and we'll continue on with this. Father, we give you thanks for you praise for this beautiful new day. We thank you for your mercies that are new to us each and every morning. Words we gather in your house as your people. We ask that your spirit may guide us through this historical journey. Well, Lord, as we, uh, as we ponder and maybe sometimes marvel at our own corporate pasts, we ask that your spirit may guide us even as we walk into the future that you have prepared for us. It is in Christ's name we pray. Amen. So, I want to begin today with what I call Reformation precursors. Now, you probably know that uh, scholars typically say the Reformation began in what year? 15 something, right? Yeah. Well, long before 15 something, let's call it, oh, I don't know, 1517, maybe, for argument's sake. Let's call it that. Um, there, are, there were a number of demands going back very early for reform within the church. Uh, some of the issues that, that really disturbed people had to do with the hierarchy and, and the way the hierarchy conducted itself. So, as early as the 10th and 11th centuries, the monastic order at, at, at Cluny um, was demanding reform, and specifically what they wanted to reform, what they wanted to reform, were the secularizing elements that were beginning to affect the monastery. Specifically, uh, two primary issues and one kind of side issue. Issue number one, they believed that the secular authority 
families had way too much to say about how the monastery was conducted. Isn't that kind of interesting? This age we think that the church is all powerful, the monastery leaders would say, hey, we would like to reform this. You guys in the secular world can't be the boss of us. Problem number one they had. Problem number two, they wanted to see a reform in something called simony. Now, no, that's not nearly as horrible as it sounds. Uh, it's not that bad. Uh, simony is the practice of selling clerical orders. In, in other words, um, uh, oh, let's pick on Peggy since she's right there. <laughs> I'm glad to see you haven't got any bar fights, by the way. That's, that's good. Um, say, hey, so say, you know, those priests live pretty darn well. You know, I, I mean, hey, they get a nice rectory, they get uh, three squares a day, put by the nuns. I mean, that's like a pretty nice life. I think I'd like to do that. Well, besides the fact that they didn't have women's priests in those days, um, barring that, if Peggy had enough cash, she could go to the church authorities and say, hey, I'd like to be a priest. Or I'd like my son to be a priest. If she really had enough cash, she could even say, you know what? I don't want to stop there. I'd like to be a bishop. So you could buy and sell clerical orders and all the privileges that went with them. So that was one of the things they objected to. Um, so they did begin to do some kind of reform, uh, mostly affected by this gentleman, who is now known as uh, Saint Odo. Saint Odo begins to reform the monastery, reform its relationship with what we might call the secular church, the church at large, and the largest secular world outside of that. Moving on, we talk at quite some length about the followers of, of, of Waldo, and you can add your favorite there as Waldo and Joe, but uh, the Waldensians, um, Waldensians, another reform movement. If you recall, Peter Waldo was a lay preacher in the 12th century in France, gathered together with people, and his theological ideas should sound somewhat familiar to you if you're coming from a Lutheran background. Waldo said, you know what? Everyone ought to be able to read the Bible in a language they can understand, as opposed to Latin or Greek. Um, Waldo also set forth the idea of transubstantiation. In other words, the priest says this and it becomes the body of Lord Christ. He thought, well, how can that be? And while you're at it, please show me what it says in the Bible. And, and finally, Waldo felt that those who were called to be preachers and teachers within the church should emulate the life of Christ. Rather than living in fancy rectories or even in palaces, as many bishops did, they should actually live lives not only of simplicity, but out and out poverty. Um, you can see what happened with that. I put the notes there. It's also from the previous week. The group sought papal approval in 1179. And the Pope said, Well, just listen to your local clergy. You know, if, if your local clergy say you can preach, you can preach. If your local clergy say you can't preach, sorry guys, you're out of luck. Well, the local clergy are not about to let a lay person, let alone a lay person who has a track of ideas preach. The followers of all who said, now, to that really anyway, the Waldensians continue to exist despite everyone's best efforts, everyone in the church's best efforts to stand them out. They actually continue to exist. You can read all you like about that, just a couple of high points. Um, the, today, Waldensian Evangelical Church, over 40,000 members. Back in 75, it merged with the Methodist Church in Italy. But you didn't even know it was Methodist Church in Italy. Now have the Waldensian Methodist Church with some, probably between the two of them, about twice as many. So, not a huge denomination, 
but, but certainly uh, something quite extraordinary in that early period of time. Pre Martin Luther was decidedly Luther the Saturday of Gates. Um, that would bring us to, uh, to John Wycliffe. John Wycliffe was born in 1324, approximately, educated at Oxford University. Um, at some point, we don't know exactly when, between 1366 and 1372, he received a doctorate in theology, the doctor of the church. Um, Wycliffe lived a quiet life in the academic mission, busy teaching other theologians. That's what you do with the doctor of the, the, the theology. If I live long enough, I'll get there maybe someday. But um, then all of a sudden, he gets involved in a dispute between Pope Gregory XI and the Third of England over <coughs> tribute payments. In other words, the church says, hey, hey, <laughs> Time to pay up. We need to build some more things. We need some more gold stuff. We need some more money. And the third says, no, I don't have to do that. I've given you guys quite enough. Well, Wycliffe comes out of the side of his king, and in fact, uh, publishes a work. <laughs> Uh, you can see right here in little page three, De Julia Dominion, the civil kingdom, basically <laughs> stating that the authority of any institution, now listen to these words, the authority of any institution depended on God's grace. And if that institution was acting in a way that was overtly sinful, obviously contrary to the teachings of Scripture, then that institution essentially forfeited its authority. In other words, you only have to listen to the church hierarchy so long as they're doing and saying things that are in accord with the teachings of Christ. Otherwise, they have no authority. So Whitefoot begins to deny the authority of the Pope, and by the way, not unlike the Waldensians before him, the doctrine of transubstantiation. That was a, a sticking point. Just, uh, let's be up here. Uh, the, the transubstantiation. Huge, huge point of conflict within the Reformation. Transubstantiation doesn't really come to be a complete monolithic doctrine within the Western Church. Potentially, until as late as the 11 or 12 months. Prior to that, the church kind of skirted the issue. Everybody had some idea that the Eucharist was important. Now, now here are a couple of thoughts on this. What, what, did, what did Jesus say in this the Last Supper? Do this in remembrance of me. Okay. Okay. Everybody here, drink, drink this stuff, eat this stuff, drink this stuff, okay? Eat, drink, do this in the room of This is my body. Okay, this is my body. Now, we have a number of ideas flowing around here, do we not? Three different people cite three different things. Well, we could reference those in Scripture, we're taking very long to find that. From that, we develop three the same theologies. Theology number one, literally taking Jesus' words. Take and eat, this is my body. Take and drink, this is my blood. So the church says, well, Jesus said it, therefore it must be true. It must actually be Christ's body and blood. One theological point. Another theological point. Originally it was written in Greek, we put it. The mm -hmm. translation now into other languages. Was there any corruption potentially? Um some so, this is my word, this is my body, could be represents, represents as a Passover. No, he really he really he really did he really did say take and eat. And when it makes my and what makes matters worse. 
it actually is an attempt that suggests an ongoing relationship. So it, 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 uh, it's very strong, it, it very strongly is in the original language. But he also says, do this in remembrance of me. So other folks say, well, look, we, we go to this ceremony every single week and we take this up and it sure seems like a piece of bread and some wine to me. I'm kind of grateful it doesn't actually taste like, well, you know. Um, so they say, well, surely he must have been just doing this in remembrance of me. And then finally, we have a third point of view. The third point of view, that's the go ahead and, and, and eat this and drink this, all of you. The idea of the Eucharist as uniting the force. Otherwise, we'll get the idea of communion. Right? So, these ideas are floating around, and finally, because institutions hate everything that's right. abstract. They really do. Institutions do not like things to be they. So imagine the church creates a theology, and this theology is called transubstantiation. We have to decide what is happening, and once we decide what is happening, we have to decide when it's happening, and ultimately, and that's what we have to understand, how it's happening. That's what transubstantiation seeks to describe. What is happening is that the physical, earthly elements turn into the body of both Christ, according to the theory. Well, I shouldn't say theory, according to the doctrine. It happens precisely when the priest pronounces itself. How it happens, still in faith. Other than it's a miraculous occurrence that we talk about a lot in the Well, the rational mind, or maybe not even the rational mind, but the protesting mind, the Protestant mind, doesn't like this very much. Why not, I suppose? There's several possible reasons. Anyone? The very idea of cannibalism, even though it's a divine part yeah. of the flesh. Yeah, I, I, would, I would actually suggest, by the way, that the idea of cannibalism and Jesus saying my body is real food for the world uh, actually has a lot to do with that concept. That's my thoughts. But that may be part of it. I, I would suggest the primary reason there was objection is because you can't find this in Scripture. You, you, really, you really can't find transubstantiation in Scripture. We, we know exactly what Jesus said, right? Exactly what those three answers. We got take and eat and drink this, all of you. Do this in remembrance. And uh, this is my body, this is my fault. So the Protestant mind, you'll notice that he's a theme that runs through. Uh, Walmart, uh, White Earth, and the others one by the moment. Each and every protest movement, despite whatever theological differences they had, all suggested is that human beings, regular people, ought to be able to read the Bible in a way they can understand. But with scripture, next we'll talk, next we'll talk about the solas, the soli, actually more properly, of the Reformation. And uh, one of those that I'm sure you're aware of is sola scriptura, scripture law, as opposed to Human ideas, what we call human ideas. Okay, questions? What role did the academy of the university support by the well, church? Typically, typically speaking, the <coughs> universities had a church connection. Okay, they had a church connection. Um, they were funded largely through the church. And the church, by the way, was funded just like we saw a little ago. The church saying to rich people, like governments, rulers, pay up. So um, 
So the universities, um, the universities were really very much academically under church control. Now, as often happens in universities, in fact, in the Missouri Synod, there was a little bit of a uh, scuttlebutt at uh, uh, about. Uh, apparently, there was a, a, a professor who was saying some things that were a little to the left of the synod's position. And it took a while for the synod to catch up with that fellow. He took it for quite a while. And it was a big, ugly controversy. And interestingly enough, the synod backed down and said, okay, professor, you can continue to teach. Even though there are a lot of clergy on the right end of things, quite in the direction, not necessarily correct. You'll have to ask them later when I think of it, if you dare. Um, and they're suggesting, well, no, this guy should be, this guy should lose his tenure, he should lose his position, because he's teaching stuff that's not in line with church doctrine. So if you take that and you amplify it 10 or 20 or 100 times, that's kind of the environment. Although interesting enough, because it didn't have things like the internet, it probably also took the church a little longer to catch up with uh, doctors of the church and flight with who were teaching things contrary to church doctrine. Other questions? Okay. So, Mill's uh, um, model page three. Wycliffe begins to deny the authority of the Pope and the doctrine of transubstantiation, and as a result, probably the answer to the question, Wycliffe begins losing support at Oxford. At the same time, he also begins to garner his own following, people he called the poor preachers. Interesting, right? The, uh, the followers of, of Waldo. They were the poor men of the you young. Know, white with followers were the poor preachers. His overall concern was to see the church imitate the life of Christ more clearly. And here it comes again with a life of poverty and simplicity. And again, themes we see throughout pre Reformation history. The church, well, let's see, we have bishops who are routinely called princes of the church. And they live like princes, they live in palaces. To this day, by the way, uh, in some areas, a bishop's residence is still referred to as a palace, despite the mission. It's kind of interesting when the palace is actually an apartment somewhere, but uh, it's still referred to that way. Um, princes of the church. Clergy living fairly splendid lives, at least compared to everyone else. Reformers keep saying, hey, wait a minute. Wasn't Jesus basically wandering around the countryside? Maybe occasionally he got to hang out at Peter's house? Occasionally he got to hang out at Lazarus in his sister's place? Most of the time he was pretty much camping out in the open and stuff? Wasn't Jesus born in the barn? And how come our church, now it's supposed to be the body of Christ, is trying to achieve all this worldly splendor? So the reformers keep saying, that's not that. Now, 1378, Wycliffe works on a translation of the Bible into English. This translation is rejected as being unauthorized. In 1382, his teachings are condemned by a church court, and Wycliffe gets himself kicked out of Oxford. Settles in the little town of Lutterworth, and dies two years later in 1384. <laughs> now, Wycliffe, because of his desire to reform the church, very poetic kind of title in some of the my scholars, he's called the Morning Star of the Reformation. Wycliffe may have been very fortunate, or I might say very blessed, in the fact that he actually survived his own efforts. He was fortunate enough to be at a time when the church was not all that interested in executions. Um, 
Uh, interestingly, interestingly um, 44 years after Wycliffe's death, 44 years after Wycliffe's death, the church would become decidedly more virulent. Once again, interested in blood and more and making example of people. So what they did, since he'd been dead for 44 years, was to, uh, to exhume his remains, which they then burned. Uh, I guess they kind of strung them together, strung his bones together, and burned it safe. The, uh, on, my, on my notes, I, 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 you know, I mean, it's not funny, but I guess it is in a way. Why burn white? I mean, he had been for 44 years, and they decided to subject him to this injustice, deciding that he was a, a heretic. And heretics, of course, what we do with them, we burn them. Um, here's a quote. It's, it's kind of a neat quote. It's long. It's, it's there up uh, <coughs> bottom for page four. Um, I'll read it to you, you can read along if you like. And it kind of surmises Wycliffe's uh, theology. The church is the totality of those who were predestined to blessedness. It includes the church triumphant in heaven, the church militant or men on earth. No one who is eternally lost is a part of it. There is one universal church. And outside of it, there is no salvation. Its head is Christ. No pope may say that he is the head, for he cannot say that he is elect, or even a member of the church. Taken made by John Wycliffe, sometime before him. And that brings us to, uh, uh, to this fellow, uh, John Hus. John Hus was priest, born in Bahia. We now refer to that as the Czech Republic. Thomas was heavily influenced by Wycliffe's writings and even circulated by that point into Bohemia. <coughs> so, as with Wycliffe, Thomas looks at the situation around him and he refuses to accept any authority and he becomes rather vocal about this. Now, what's interesting is that John Thomas and his followers, unlike Earlier attempts to reform, they were actually um, of, of, of some noble lineage. They had some money on it. So the end result is that John Lewis finds himself in the public eye much faster than Michael did. Us refuses to accept papal authority, he's excommunicated in 1410. That doesn't stop him from spreading his message. In 1414, there is a church council. Huss is tried, convicted of heresy in Constance, Germany, and he is burned at stake, still protesting his innocence. Um, probably spurious, but interesting, the legend is that his last words before he succumbed to the flames was that a century from now, God will raise up someone that will reform the church. Um, we can think about that for a moment. Um, in 1999, not all that long ago, it looks like a few long ago, 1999, Pope John Paul II apologized for a number of things, including Huss's execution. Um, a series of wars. Remember, uh, Hussites, followers of us, have some money. So, a series of wars. There was the Hussite wars to place in Bohemia between the years 1419 and 1434. Us's followers had a doctrine, it's a mouthful, called Ulfricism, the view that both the bread and wine should be given to all during the communion service rather than restricting the line to the clergy. Um, you're probably aware, if you come from a Roman Catholic background, or if you are uh, never been to Roman Catholic service, that it's fairly common practice in many Roman Catholic churches to this day for the laity, the common people, to only receive the bread, the host, and the priests. Right? 
the wine. Um, that's something that started, by the way, a very, very, very long time ago, probably going all the way back to the ninth or tenth centuries. Um, been that way for a long time. Moses, wait a minute. Didn't Jesus say, uh, "Drink this all of you"? You know, not just the guy who's in charge. Um, standing on a bit of technicality, but nonetheless, he felt that this is the way it should be. Um, by the way, this view is ultimately accepted by the Roman Catholic Church and as, as part of a treaty or a series of settlements that, uh, that ended the wars, and that lasted until 1567 when there was a reversal. We'll bring this to something called the Western Schism. Sometimes you'll hear people talk about this as the Great Schism. And, um, uh, and I don't mean to do this, but I will simply instruct you. Order you with that. Keeping in mind, I don't know as much authority as the Pope does here. But I'll order you anyway to not refer to it as that. Because the Great Schism actually refers to the schism between the Eastern and Western churches from back to 1054. So we don't want to confuse those things. Um, Western schism, or the papal schism, that's why it's called that in a moment, was a split with the Roman Catholic Church. It lasted from 1378 to 1418. What happened is that there were several men, specifically three at the height of it, who all claimed to be the true Pope. Probably driven more by politics than anything else. Um, Finally, by the way, it was ended by the Council of Constance, that same council, by the way, where Danos died. Um, the rival claims to the papacy, in fact, did a lot to hurt the office. Uh, imagine this if you would. <coughs> the church says the Pope speaks in local Christian, in other words, in the place of Christ. The Pope speaks. Now you have salaries, <coughs> everyday people, at least once while to think about this stuff. And they're looking at the situation from some distance and saying, wait a minute, the church is saying the Pope speaks in place of Christ, but the way I see it, we got three different people, three yahoos, all claiming to be the Pope. Really? In place of Christ? Uh, I mean, is Jesus a uh, schizo here or what? So, doesn't, doesn't, they don't do themselves any favor with this. Um, here's how it works. Uh, the papacy found itself leaving Rome. The papacy leaves Rome uh, because Rome has gotten so contentious. It's so difficult, the Pope says, okay, I can't handle it anymore. You lose the Holy See, get out of here. Press. You know what? That's a nice town. They got pretty architecture here. They got beauty. Great wine. Great wine, there you go. Although I guess the Italian wine is pretty good too. Um, anyway, they moved out of them. 70 years later, the people in Rome are saying, wait a minute, the Pope is supposed to be the Bishop of Rome. Get him back here. You can read all the ugly details of this. Same time, I'll skip a little bit, but it's there for you to read. Um, this goes on. This goes on for a number of years. In um, 1410, you have a third person saying, no, I'm the Pope. Anyway, it, it, it is, uh, I bring this up, I suppose beyond this is interest, to, to suggest just how confusing things were for people. Just how, you know, we'll talk about the Roman Catholic Church as, it's, as if it's a constant model of the church this, the church that, the church the next thing. And yet we see all of this in Bible. Nothing new. Then going back to the Crusades. 
The fourth crusade, if you recall, was not Christian versus Muslim at all. The fourth crusade turned out to actually be Christian against Christian. West versus East. So Christianity has an interesting history of fighting to itself. We don't have to do that today, of course, but uh, it was just also about that. Or the prize, the case may be. Um, the, uh, this may be, you know, this is opinion, I'm writing this out as opinion. Not scholarship, but sure opinion. It may be that whatever. We have come to pattern ourselves after the world. We are inevitably going to have strife. Because the world's governments, if you think about it, work based on strife, based on conflict. If you know conflict, you can argue you need a government. The whole idea of government is to do something with the strife. The other great religion in the news that we sometimes speak of as a monolith. Islam is. The Muslim is that. And yet, right now, even as we speak, they're going through their own internal struggles, which if we were to examine them closely, read a lot like the internal struggles of the Christian church. And, by the way, just as bloody, but probably no bloody. So, opinion. Jesus says, my kingdom is not of this world. End of the um, So, What's interesting about all of this, um, by the way, they like, they like Martin. I'm not from Ireland. Martin, Pope Martin. Martin V. 1417 to 1431. It is the first Pope um, in Italian, by the way. Imagine that in Italian, besides the what's the name of Martin. Okay. Um, the first one in 40 years to be able to actually command the entire religion of the whole Western Church. Even more interesting, perhaps, the Council of Constance, despite deciding that it needed to kill Genovus and stamp out a number of other little heresies here and there, it comes up with some reforms of its own. For example, they say, Pope. Oh, even if his office is divinely instituted, is in fact not an absolute monarch, but merely a constitutional ruler. So Pope is, after all, elected. <laughs> Goes on to say that the Pope, his authority is in fact delegated to him by the entire community. Sounds oddly modern, does it not? Sounds oddly, it's practically un American. The Pope is possessed of a merely ministerial authority delegated here by the community of the faithful for the good of the church. The community of the faithful, sorry for the professor speak, the community of the faithful has not exhausted its inherent authority just because they elect their ruler. What am I trying to say there? Just because the people elect a president doesn't mean the people are relinquishing their power. They still have the power. And by the way, if the Pope is not doing his job, the people can take him out. The community, the faithful, can exercise power by its representatives, assemble the general council, even in certain critical cases, against the wishes of the Pope, and if need be, and judge, chastise, and even the Pope's Pope. 
That's what that council of constants decides prior to the Reformation. Interesting. Okay. Opinion again. Scripture would remind us that the word of the Lord does not return void. It says it's not. So, we preach, we tell the truth. God gives it to us. We don't always get to see the results, do we? And yet, if we believe what Scripture says, there's some efficacy to our preaching. Is it possible that even though the church is not real impressed with Paul, um, even though he managed to survive, um, not real impressed with Wycliffe, although he managed to survive, definitely not impressed with John Lewis, even if he doesn't survive. Nonetheless, some element of the truth is in. Because we see this progression that appears to be moving, not perfectly far from it, but in a more equitable state. Possibly. Just maybe. And an opinion. Uh, questions or thoughts? Sir? Was that ever hmm? Was that ever reversed? Uh, yeah. We get to the counter, we get to the counter reformation which we'll talk about at the end of next week's session. And counter-reformation, as the name would imply, is pushback against the Reformation. It's pushback done in the form of saying, okay, we get your point, we got this and this. But the end result of that is they say, well, this is only came to be because we have to our authority. Um, and by the way, am I saying that things might have gotten better in the Roman Catholic Church? Um, I say that by a matter of degrees. But remember, it, it is into the beginning of the 20th century that the Inquisition technically the end. So, um, and the last person to be executed was in 1848. So, um, it didn't get out. Other questions? Other thoughts? Okay. Um, Let's see, that's um, a picture of uh, John Lewis, uh, somewhat stylized, uh, being uh, executed. This is, um, this, this map kind of gives you an idea of what happened during the so-called uh, Avignon Papacy, or sometimes called the Avignon Captivity by Catholic scholars, um, as if the papacy were being held captive. Um, so we have, uh, we have a pope here, we have another pope here, oh, and look at this, is a blue area, we have still another one, that's kind of a geography of it. Okay, you, you know, you, you kind of have to, uh, well, maybe not you, but I admire anyone who can make me look kind of sus. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Henry VIII. Um, this may be the most egregious oversimplification to date. Um, the study of the English Reformation is really complex, really detailed, and it's enough to make you the most dedicated scholar is as it goes back and forth, and back and forth. And it was ugly. Um, they apparently really liked this movie. And uh, they did. But um, this, is the, this is the oversimplification version. Enough, you know, I mean, English Reformation begins with King Henry VIII's quest for a male heir. Well, we know. The story, right? It's a stuff of legend. King Henry VIII wants a male heir. Why does he want a male heir? He wants to keep, he wants to keep the monarchy in his line. Those days, 
the, 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 the woman could not become the sovereign directly in that, in that manner. There are other ways women could become sovereign, but if the king only gives birth to daughters, it's going to be a cousin, or a second cousin, or a third cousin. And if King Henry did not have a male heir, the monarch would have gotten pretty far removed from his family line. So he uh, marries wife number one, and she produces daughters. Interestingly enough, well, you know, I guess if you think this way, it's good to be the king. Because uh, King Henry had himself, like, like, like any red blooded, hot blooded monarch, he had himself a few, uh, um, what's the polite term? A concubines. And it seems that there were a few male children born in those relationships. The problem? They were illegitimate. They could become a duke, an earl. Few duke and earl, I think that. <laughs> um, they could become a lot of things, but they could not be as a crown prince and never went on a king. The actual wife, for whatever reason, daughter. So after a while, he says, uh, you know, that's not going to work. You can look this up for yourself after a series of texts to get annulments. King Henry says, well, I can't get annulment. How about I just um, say that my wife is treasonous and have her, um, you know, Eventually, the Pope says, no. You can't go anymore. Well, I want to know it. Maybe what? The Pope says, uh, did you have marital relations with her? Yeah. But I can't give her a moment. Well, why do you think you say so? The Pope says, because I'm the Pope. And by the way, it's really important that you listen to me because you're one of your titles as the King of England is Defender of the Faith. To this day, by the way, the title of the child, Defender of the Faith. Among other things. Um, so here's Pope Clement. Clement VII refused to annul Henry's marriage to Catherine of Aragon so he could remarry. So what does he do in 1534? He says that he alone is in charge of matters pertaining to the English church. He essentially separates himself from the church of Rome. And he says, okay, we're our own church now. We're our own church. And my church is okay if you can get forced. Interestingly enough, that was not a privilege that was handed down to the common people. Just a king. As I said, it's just a king. Um, so, that's not all he did. He decides to dissolve the English monasteries by the way, confiscating their wealth and land. And, and maybe slightly better than that, he begins to place the Bible, there it is again, the scripture, begins to place the Bible into the hands of the common people. <laughs> I, I found this extraordinary, I hope you will too. He began to require that every parish have at least one Bible. So what does that mean? It means that prior to that, there were entire parishes it did not even have a Bible on the premises. No. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, was that um, the English translation, or was it they had a Bible in Latin or some other language? Well, it started off, it started off as a Bible in Latin. There were, there were numerous attempts to, to create uh, numerous attempts to create an English language um, uh, translation. Some of them fight, uh, some of them fight for. Uh, it isn't until we get to King James. 1611. 1611, we have the so called King James or authorized version of the Bible, an official, an official version. Um, there are some other 
translations prior to that, uh, some of which can be quite interesting to read, um, particularly if you compare them either to the Latin or to the Hebrew and then later Greek um, versions, you'll see that some of these folks have attempted to um, do the translation, you might have been C students at best in, uh, in the Greek and Hebrew. Um, so, so in, in truth, this is a little off topic moment, but in truth, the, uh, the production of the King James Bible, which is all good at that point, was a tremendous and, and monumental effort. Finish on the Regardless of what you personally think of using the King James Bible, don't let anyone tell you it's not a worthy translation. Um, it was an amazing effort, not only for their time, but actually for, for any time. Uh, when I'm talking about that, um, someone asked, do, do the corruptions creep in? Um, opinion, but not how we all, in fact, most linguists uh, would probably agree with me. Any translation of anything, simply in virtue of being a translation, is corrupt. Not necessarily corrupt on a moral level, it's not necessarily trying to pull a book on It's just that you will lose something in translation, pardon me, or not, not those, you lose something in translation. Um, <coughs> you know, I, I'm like a fan of. Uh, classic literature, um, and uh, I guess it was a long of you know, my geeky personality, right? So I cannot begin to tell you how different, maybe some of you know this, how different various translations are of the Odyssey. It was an almost Odyssey. Um, in more recent times, even languages we think we understand and define native speakers and, and for good native speakers, how, how difficult it is to come up. We're still working at it. A conclusive translation of, oh, say, uh, Tulsa or Dostoevsky. Um, you, you, you think we have old English mastered by now. But even as I speak, there's somebody working on a new translation of Beowulf. You know, you'd think old English Saxon militants at least have that long time. We're still working on that. But, you know, I, I also know that when I speak to my musical colleagues in, in Germany or the Netherlands, that um, even though I, I who read and write uh, Dutch and German fairly well, even then they're still, you know, when they get a little casual like, you know, when they start using, you know, kind of homeboy expressions, all of them say, what? And they note the same thing, by the way, when I'm kind of tired or just feeling a little more relaxed, and I start writing colloquial English. And they know when I you know, what? And, and, and you get the idea. The translations are, 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 are inherently flawed. <laughs> okay. Uh, after Henry's death, after Henry's death, England begins to move towards Calvinism. I know we haven't talked about Calvinism in the next week. Move towards Calvinism, becoming Protestants. Um, and in the sixth, sixth year reign, um, then they had a kind of a, a, a reaction, I mentioned tactical, tactical oversimplification, but under Mary I, under Mary I, who managed to become queen through all kinds of complexity, was a loyal Roman Catholic. And he swung back towards Catholicism. Finally, we get to uh, Elizabeth I. Um, Elizabeth I. Um, uh, no comment. Um, this is the first version can go away. No comment. During her 24 year reign, she kind of cast the Church of England as, as this kind of moderate way. 
middle way, somewhere between Protestantism and Catholicism. As a result, the church services essentially were the mass um, in English, in English prayer. Um, and uh, eventually they did get there, eventually they did get there. Um, there the Bible would take it to so they able to follow their translation. But we're getting close. Um, okay, real quick, since I see time is kind of growing short. Um, some of the social changes that took place prior to the Reformation. This is, um, this is a painting by Raphael, it's probably hard to see. It's not the greatest reproduction. Uh, painting by Raphael depicting the Renaissance zeitgeist. What's the Renaissance? Yeah, I'm literally, by the way, I'm from French. Uh, uh, yeah. Um, yeah, very good in the 14th and 16th centuries. An attempt to recapture the plurality of scholars believed to be the best of Western society's accomplishments, specifically going back to the classical era, which for them would have meant the Greek era. So all of a sudden, if you could see this a little bit better than, um, than I can, uh, maybe, uh, if you could see it, you would discover that even though there are a lot of people in the picture, they're all kind of almost like extras on a movie set, they're all drawn and painted in according to classical Greek lines. They all look like they've been working out at the gym five days a week. So they all look like Olympic athletes. So Renaissance of the humanists believe the best models of learning are the classical Greek and Roman civilizations. Meanwhile, the religious realm, religion begins to say, you know what? We want some rebirth too. So something called devotion mondiana, modern devotion, begins around the 14th century. And um, all from the Netherlands get rid of it. Get rid of it. Um, found something called the Brethren of the Common Life. Once again, common theme, emphasis placed on scripture and private meditation. Simplicity, purity of life, movement spreads to Germany and other parts of North Europe, particularly Northern Europe, um, finds its expression, expression in Thomas Campus' work, Imitation of Christ, 1418. This movement's emphasis on private rather than communal devotion really kind of makes it one of the Reformation precursors. By the way, they managed to stay mostly out of trouble, partly because everything was needed to change. Um, let's see what else I can show you here. Um, really quickly, Erasmus. Erasmus. Um, uh, that's Erasmus. Classic picture of Erasmus. Um, he was one of the folks who was educated in this modern devotion, committed to Christian humanism, and humanist principles, and towards a peaceful, reformed church. Well, Erasmus had an idea. The church, particularly its government, its institutions, its worship, even its theology, needed reforming. Um, Erasmus produces a version of the New Testament in Greek. Why would he do that? Because by then, scholars, or pseudo scholars perhaps, were reading their New Testaments entirely in Latin. And again, translations lead to problems. It is fascinating whether we can read some of those Vulgate Latin Bibles. Um, Erasmus' vision was that the scriptures made available to all. He was uh, quoted as saying in his preface, I could wish that these were translated into each and every language, that the farmer might save snatches of scripture as plow, and the weaver might hum phrases of scripture 
fully the shot. Some of you may have heard of Erasmus, so or if you do, it's a footnote in your history book. Erasmus' ideas came to be overshadowed by those outlined by Martin Luther. If you look at the years there, you'll see why that is. Um, so, some folks have said that, uh, it's kind of a funny statement, I think. Erasmus laid the egg that Luther hatched. And uh, I don't know, I found this. Um, <laughs> 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 um, and this is, this is from, uh, I guess, a high school uh, or, or even more of an elderly class, but I thought it was kind of neat. Uh, Rasmus Egg was reform, not, not break. Ideas are the foundation. You know, Rasmus laid the egg and moved the hash. So, um, what else? Invention of movable type. Printing by uh, Johann Luther, the big technological revolution, perhaps the biggest technological revolution of his day, movable type. Now, now they had printing, but in order to print, you, 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 you literally had to create these plates. They were permanent fixtures that you made of lead. For a long time, you could have written out how you made them. So, um, Gutenberg, um, okay. <laughs> we gotta have some humor out of that. Uh, this is a, a picture by an artist by the name of Joe McFadden. Um, it's actually not a bad painting in some ways, if we look at our eyes. Um, but uh, that's probably what we're more used to seeing. Um, the um, ooh, hi, printing. The Reformation. I shouldn't say it could not happen. It would have taken a lot longer. Or Erasmus and Luther might have been two more John Stars without printing. Um, you know what I wrote there? It also meant that ideas and concepts judged radical would be harder to control. A paper bomb. Propaganda. Um, get it out there. Erasmus' work, handbook of the Christian soldier, 1503, an appeal to educated men and women, whom Erasmus regarded as the church's most important resource. Production of Bibles in the vernaculars, which is a German Bible, all the way back to 1466. The greatest of translations, but an attempt. Um, final thought here. Black Plague. Black Plague had led to the death of millions in the 14th century. People were preoccupied with death. But that's the point of memory. The world is ready for new birth. Society began to recover by the 15th century. And interestingly, the power of the traditional aristocracy is being increasingly challenged by the emergence of the merchant classes by the entrepreneurial classes. All of a sudden, something for the first time in Western history, a large scale thing can happen. In theory, at least, if you work hard enough, you can rise above the place of birth. To summarize early Reformation history, the oldest Protestant churches, um, the Moravian Church, um, originated as Unitas Fratrum. Unity of the Brethren. Um, they go back all the way to John Lewis. The Moravian Church, as most of you should know, uh, still exists to this day. It is a Protestant church that predates the Lutheran Church. Um, they managed to survive primarily because they were led for a change by someone with some money. Um, later Protestant churches generally date their doctrinal separation from the Catholic Church. Uh, the 16th century, Reformation, in almost all cases, began as an attempt to reform, not overthrow, or even separate oneself from the Roman Catholic Church, typically by priests who opposed what they perceived as false doctrines, which I basically call ecclesiastic malpractice, 
particularly, and this will bring us up to next week, the sale of indulgences or the abuse thereof. Uh, Simon, that's the selling of clerical orders, um, which reformers saw as evidence, a large evidence of corruption within the church's hierarchy between the fall. Uh, the last slide, that is the, that by the way is a window depicting the symbol of the Moravian church. And that'll bring us up to next week. Um, uh, Alger Zwingli, John Allen, uh, and Paul. Okay, questions? Anyone? All right, that means obviously I was incredibly clear. <laughs> I have totally tired you out, or you're completely done talking. <laughs> Whatever the case may be, all of the above. All of the above. Thank you. Thank you for your honesty. Um, all of this continues to be online. The notes are online. Should you move the papers and share it with the house? Um, <coughs> recording this. Questions at all will be online. Uh, go, to, go to the church's website, follow the links. You can see week one, week two, week three, week four. And probably that's in 1995. Let's close the program. Father, we thank you for this time you allowed us. Where truth has been spoken, we ask that they take root in our hearts and our minds. So that by your spirit, by your grace, by your love, we may be ever more prepared to walk in the works which have been prepared for us in advance by our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ.